Uh, I'm Alwyn. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Creativity and Professional Practice. And basically what I investigate is the relationship between emotions and creative task performance. Uh, and I'm doing that in the context of designing technology as well. So there's going to be some psychology in this talk, briefly, and some nerdy stuff about designing tech as well at the end. Uh, so I'm going to break this up into three pieces, you could say. One will be about briefly about this link between emotion and creativity, and then we'll move to uh, physicality, uh, embodiment, things like literally motion uh, and posture for using, uh, for regulating emotions. So first, some brief definitions. Usually, we all know emotions, they, they tend to build up a little bit. They're not, usually, they're not just there suddenly. Could be sometimes, but usually they gradually build. Uh, and the interesting thing is that they are self-regulatory, at least to some degree. Uh, and what they do is that they facilitate some kind of response or adaptation to something that's personally relevant. So let's say, very simple, you see something you really want, you think, oh, that would make me happy. Then you adapt your system, basically, to be able to get there. You get new goals, how do I get that thing? Uh, you activate different action tendencies, you could say, to, to drive the body to do that. And obviously, we all know that you know, if we're a bit interested in creativity research, creativity is really about coming up with uh, solutions or artifacts that are novel uh, and effective in some way, uh, both at the same time. So, if you go to that link between emotion and creativity, it's quite complicated in a way. Obviously, there are lots of emotions, uh, and emotion itself is already an ill-defined concept. And creativity usually can be broken into smaller pieces, so generating ideas is part of a creative process on the one hand, but also uh, creativity can also be risky, so you need to be motivated to do something. You need to be willing to invest more, research or, uh, more resources in, uh, in a creative activity than you might do for another activity. Uh, obviously, these are very big claims uh, to put in there, but it's kind of, it gives you a gist of what's going on. And if you look at this link, for example, we see, if you review, for instance, psychology literature, we see that having a mild, mild positive emotion, if you can keep that up, slightly increased positive emotion, you basically slightly increase your dopamine release in the areas that help you switch more easily uh, to uh, to basically use different types of information, to relay, relay different types of information to the brain. And it turns out that that's actually helpful for, helpful for generating ideas. Uh, you can imagine that basically this means that it's, you're less likely to get stuck into fixating on one area of ideas, and you're, you're, you can more easily incorporate others. Uh, on the other hand, you could see that emotions associated with uncertainty, for example, a little bit, a little bit of anxiety, for instance, can actually help you to evaluate your ideas. That's because you don't want uncertainty usually. You want to repair your uncertainty, and because you can't use any heuristics to do that, uh, uh, otherwise you would have certainty, you could say. Uh, you basically start to take a more structured and analytical approach to be sure that. You understand what's going on. That actually helps you evaluate your ideas a bit better. Uh, then again, you could also look at emotions and try to parse them in, in relation to coping potential. And for example, people being angry, it's always a strange example, but for example, if, if you're angry, angry people can take on the biggest guy in the bar, they think at least. It kind of raises your self-motivation, or at least your beliefs that in your own abilities. And it's the same for happiness, and they're the same for pride, for instance. And actually, it turns out that these type of emotions tend to lift self-motivation just a little bit, which gives you an advantage in, in kind of going through the creative process as a whole. Um, so there's lots of, lots of these things. And basically, it boils down to the question, you know, emotion constitutes some kind of adaptive response. And the creative activity, you could say, also needs some kind of thing that helps you uh, perform better. For example, if you look at mild positive emotions again, you remember that that would help you relay information more flexibly. Uh, 
And if you look at creative ID generation, and usually you would say that generating many and very different ideas can give you a small advantage, and, and at least it would, would increase the probability a little bit that one of these generated ideas is original or uh, can be made original in later stages. So you could say that through these kind of cycles, you could explain these different links. And for example, taking this uncertainty thing, that would mean that ID evaluation fares well by people being more critical, looking more critical at whatever uh, they're evaluating. So that's kind of this idea about the link between emotion and creativity. So if you want to, I know this is a lot to take in very briefly. If you want to know more about that, I'll have a poster at uh, Refactory as well. You can find me during the lunch and ask a lot of questions about that. We can discuss that. And back to the motion part, of course. What's the, mo what's the link between motion and creativity? It's maybe a bit strange. Well, we all know that, for example, uh, when we see something we like, we might smile. The interesting thing uh, with emotion is that there are different components. And all these components, they drive each other forward, but they also feed back into each other. And basically, this makes sure that this, this is about this self-regulatory process of emotion, you could say. Because you could imagine the following. Uh, let's say you see something, you know, you want that. You have the action tendencies. That, the action tendencies are brought about to actually get that thing. You get new goals. How do I do this? Uh, obviously, getting new goals feed back into how you evaluate things. Uh, you have somatic responses that would support these actions, for example, neuroendocrine changes like the dopamine release, other things, increased heartbeat, etc. Uh, and you also have expressions. And this is basically what it's about, this link between emotion and emotion, this expression part. So basically, it turns out that not only does smiling occur after seeing something nice, actually smiling while seeing something nice makes the nice thing even nicer. And so basically, that's, that's kind of a funny thing. And you see this in real life a lot as well. And you get this, you can basically turn this around at the same time. For instance, uh, if we don't want to smile, and, and if, we, if we, we don't want to feel that emotion, we can try to suppress it. So basically, that would already tell you that the fact that you use your body to not feed back that uh, motor expression, that motion, uh, that would already kind of suppress and push back that emotional response. And the other way around, obviously, when actually you would make sure that the emotional response is congruent with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the physical reaction, then it would kind of provide, it would reinforce that, kind of provides positive feedback to that. And you would see this in laughing therapy, for instance, always a bit strange, perhaps, but it kind of works. We thought we can use that for technology, maybe. Maybe it's weird, but I thought it was quite interesting to try that. So we're not focusing on smiling in technology, usually. You're focusing on doing stuff, using your arms to do things, using your hands and fingers to control your devices. And we designed a study to actually check that. We're just interested, you know, can we translate this stuff to, to regulate emotion? And, uh, for example, in, in our case, we would look at using arm movements, and we would design different arm movements based on arm movements that would associate with positive emotions and arm movements that would associate with negative emotions, and then just use them in kind of a technology setup, just to use them to control some kind of device. If you go back to this idea between this link between emotion and creativity, that would mean that if, indeed, uh, you can use the body to regulate emotions, to kind of drive emotions into a specific direction, uh, that would also mean that if you would drive it into a more positive direction, that would help ID generation. And that's basically what we tested. Uh, so we did the... the, the well, often disliked uh, alternative users task, uh, in which people are basically asked to generate as much uses as they can for a brick, uh, original uses, that is. And we use an experimental setup to do that. And to assess this, we basically analyzed people's ideas. We counted the ideas, how many ideas do people come up with. 
uh, how many different semantic categories are people using? Basically, that would reflect some kind of flexibility, so the ability to switch, to think differently more easily. And originality, which we assess by basically taking all of the ideas that everyone generated during the task and looking at the ones that seem kind of unique, that no one else uh, uh, reproduced. And we assess the emotions simply by having people uh, mark on the Likert scale, saying, you know, I, I felt more negative afterwards, I felt more positive afterwards, just self-report. Um, so slightly about the design, so basically the positive emotion gesture that we designed is very simple, it would just be something like this, and you would, uh, and then the negative emotion gesture would be something like this, so basically that would be something like, okay, uh, once we're born already, we get used to bringing stuff close to us, for example, food that we want, that we need. Whereas, very young already, we, we get used to pushing things away that we don't want. So that would be very much entrenched in our system, you could say. And we also figured that these motions need to co coincide somewhat with when an emotion is occurring, obviously. Difficulty is just that you don't know when an emotion occurs. So our solution was to make an audio recorder. We basically hypothesized that you know, every time you generate an idea, you would probably appraise that idea slightly thereafter. You, know, you, you probably know slightly after generating an idea whether that idea was very original, whether it would help you uh, solve the problem, whether you would be doing well or not. Uh, so we figured, you know, if we can design an audio recorder and we instruct people, you know, use either this gesture or this gesture to record your ideas, then that would coincide these movements uh, with an emotional response, more or less, if it would occur. So that's kind of that's kind of it. And we we designed some technology to do that. We designed a technology called myography, which basically listens to your muscle activity. So we could trigger, we could figure out uh, how much muscle activity people were using while doing the movement. And we used uh, the famous Kinect sensor, which is used for gaming quite often. And what you can do with that is basically track the points on someone's body in general, but used it to track the points on someone's arm. So we, we could figure out what type of movement they were doing and design the system in such a way that doing this movement actually triggers the recording or doing this movement triggers uh, an audio recorder. And then through triggering that audio recorder, you could just, you know, record your ideas. And it worked. That's very strange, I thought at least. I mean, the theory is there, but it's always counterintuitive. So basically, we figured out that using this movement to record your ideas uh, versus that movement to record your ideas helps you come up with slightly more ideas, uh, slightly more flexible ideas, uh, and also quite more original ideas. And we see also a difference of about 10% uh, uh, in emotion. Basically, this would say that people were 10% happier uh, significantly afterwards than uh, doing this movement and doing that movement. And so basically, in that sense, it works. So it's quite funny. And then we also looked at some models, and we figured out, you know, we can, we can learn more about this. So basically what we found that uh, originality was quite important here. And so we see that there's no direct relationship between our movement. You can see that whether there is one or two stars behind these numbers. And, but if arm gestures would either target flexibility by flexibility or originality, or directly originality, then there would be a strong link with emotion. And well, that's basically the result of uh, what I've been doing uh, the last two months or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite funny. So basically we can design technology to, you know, using different movements to basically regulate our emotions a little bit. And it actually helps creativity quite a lot. And that's basically uh, what I have to say. So if you have any questions, please.